and welcome to the Messianic Tour Observer's Sabbath Thoughts and Reflections. I'm Rod Thomas. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for fellowshipping with me here on this blessed day of rest. For it is here that we gather every Shabbat to delve into Jehovah's eternal words of life, his instructions in righteousness, which is our constitution and the foundation for our covenant relationship with the creator of the universe. And as always, it is our hope, trust, and prayer that this installment of TMTO finds you, your families, and fellowships well and blessed. So let's open up in prayer here before we get started. Father, I want to, we come before you this day and we thank you, Father, for yet another Sabbath day. You've taken us through a week, Father, of many challenges, of many events, of many things, and you've offered us numerous opportunities to serve you, to grow in the image of our master, to overcome the things that beset us and uh, that inhibit our walk with you and with our master Yeshua. And we're thankful, Father, for this day of rest, a day that you set aside from the other six days. And you told us, Father, to keep it holy and that you provided us the opportunity to convocate and to sit at your feet and learn of you and your ways. So we're asking, Father, on this Sabbath, as we come before you in our time of learning, our time of meditation, our time of introspection, that you open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the things that you have for us, and that you will give us the wherewithal to enact those things that we learn, that you will build us up where we are weak, and you will enhance those areas that we are strong. We also ask, Father, that you will touch those in our families, those who we are close to, who have yet to come to understand the truth, this truth, the truth of the true faith once delivered, to understand the necessity to walk in covenant relationship with you, we ask, Father, that you will touch them, that you will bring them into the fold. Bless this Sabbath day, Father, and bless this time we have together. Amen and amen. Now, our Torah reading this week is found in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, through Genesis chapter 7, verse 24. It's a very familiar passage of Torah that uh, it bears a good many themes and concepts and spiritual applications. But for us today, I want us to focus on just one central theme, if you will. And that theme has to do with pleasing Jehovah in perilous times. How do we make it through difficult times while staying in, while successfully operating in Yah's will? And it is the example of Noah that we find here in our reading today, this Sabbath, that I believe provides us an excellent understanding of how we are to operate in perilous times as people of God, as people of Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahuwah, however you declare his name. So in order that we remain within the confines of our theme here today, we will read just select verses of the overall parasha, the overall reading, and then discuss in detail the likely meaning of these verses and identify those spiritual principles that will enhance our walk with Messiah. And as in previous discussions, we will, or I should say, I will be reading from the Robert Alter translation, and uh, we will also consider content from related biblical and extra-biblical references. And as always, I encourage you, to take what we discuss here, and if you are so led, conduct your own study and allow the Ruach HaKodesh to guide your understanding, as always. Let's begin 
We're going to start with verse 9 of chapter 6 in Genesis. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. And the Robert Alter translation reads, This is the lineage of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless in his time. Noah walked with Elohim. Alter's rendering of the Hebrew term Toleda, Toleda, here in the first part of verse 9, he interprets as lineage in the English. But in most English translations, the term used is generations. And one could spend a great deal of time pondering what this actually means, generations, lineage, Toleda. But the most accurate interpretation of Toledo, as used here in the first part of the verse, is this is the story of. This is the story of. In other words, this is the story of Noah. And its use here is that of a marker, if you will, as it conveniently establishes the start of a new addition to the overall pre-flood story. Storyline. As it relates to Noah being described as a righteous man here, the conservative Orthodox perspective on this is simply that Noah maintained good relationships with his fellow humans. And this comes from a commentary by J. H. Hertz in his Torah and Haftarah book. Now, who am I to argue with a renowned rabbi? All I will say in regards to this rabbinic understanding of righteousness, as used here in our text, is that it lacks, it lacks in terms of the role Jehovah plays in the granting of Noah's stated righteousness. In other words, it is Jehovah who declares someone righteous. And it is, as we discussed in our last installment to the Paul and Hebrew Ruth series entitled The Righteousness of God is the Place Where Faith and Obedience Intersect, our trusting, obedient faith is the thing that causes Jehovah to confer upon us righteous or right standing before him. And I would encourage you, if you've not already done so, to listen to or read this passage, and I'll Drop the link to that post in the show's transcript for your convenience. You can find it over there at www.themessianictorobserver.org. Now, I guess it can also be said that outside of one's trusting, obedient faith leading him or her, being deemed righteous by Jehovah, that one's behaviors or the way one carries or conducts themselves may be described as righteous or righteousness as well. And to some degree, this is true. Certainly, Noah carried himself in the place and time he lived in a righteous manner. But as far as I'm concerned, Jehovah is the one who confers righteousness upon an individual. And in this case, Father asserts that Noah walked with him and that Noah was blameless in the time or generation he lived. Father is expressing this through the pen of Noah. And all of what Noah did to be deemed righteous by Jehovah can be summarized or packaged as a result of Noah's faith. Noah's faith. We'll get more into this. With the second use of the English term generations in this ninth verse, Alter renders it as in his time. In other words, in Noah's time. The Hebrew term is used here, as used here, I should say, is not Tolada, Tolada as in previous generation use or lineage as, as um, Alter renders it. This time, the Hebrew 
term is used here is doer. Doer, which means period of time, generation, or age. So in this sense, Moshe is telling us that Noah was uncorrupted. He was unspotted, he, and he was morally untainted as the rest of humanity had become in that age, in that time, period. Noah's name, Noah's name, um, here in Hebrew is Noach. Noach. Since I'm not a person who, uh, I, I use a lot of Hebrew names and terminology and things, but since I haven't really used it that much in Noah's sense. I'm just going to stick with Noah for this discussion. But know that in Hebrew, his name is Noach, spelled N-O-A-C-H in our English. But yeah, I'm, I'm, in terms of the letter designations in Hebrew, I'm not a person to get that from. So, But we would pronounce it something similar to Noach. And noach means to rest or for one to take a rest. And thus a lot may be entertained and considered as it relates to the applicability of the meaning of Noah's name as it relates to this great story. But for our purposes, we will save that discussion on the meaning of Noah's name for another time. Now, the descriptor of Noah being blameless... In the KJV, the English term used is perfect. Noah being perfect or blameless in all his ways in his day, in his time, in his generation, lends to and even supports Jehovah's declaring of Noah to be righteous, to be a righteous man, that is, found or declared to be in right standing before a holy and righteous Elohim, found innocent of guilt by the court of heaven. Blameless is the Hebrew term tamim. Tamim means to be complete, whole, entire, sound. Tamim, or perfect in the English, is next used in Torah in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, to describe how Jehovah wanted Avraham to behave and walk before him. But it's not until we get to Leviticus chapter 22, verses 21 through 25, that we get a better sense of what Jehovah means by one being perfect, by one being blameless, by one being to meme. And the KJV reads, And whosoever offereth a sacrifice of peace offerings unto Jehovah to accomplish his vow, or a free will offering, in beeves or sheep, it shall be perfect to be accept. There shall be no blemish therein. Verse 22. Blind, or broken, or maimed, or having a wen, or scurvy, or scaved, you shall not offer these unto Jehovah, nor make an offering by fire of them upon the altar unto Jehovah. Verse 23. Either a bullock or a lamb that hath anything superfluous or lacking in its parts, that mayest thou offer for a free will offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. Verse 24, Ye shall not offer unto Jehovah that which is bruised, or crushed, or broken, or cut, neither shall ye make any offering thereof in your land. Verse 25, Neither from a stranger's hand shall ye offer the bread of your Elohim or of any of these, because their corruption is in them, and blemishes be in them, they shall not be accepted for you. So we're talking about an offering being as perfect as you can get to be offered, the only sacrifice to be offered to Jehovah, meeting the exacting specifications for an offering, 
is one that is to meme the best that we can get. Perfect, blameless to meme. Later on in Torah, we find Jehovah instructing Yisrael to not take on or live according to the ways of the Canaanites as it relates to spiritual or religious matters, but rather they were to be perfect with Jehovah. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 13. Jehovah instructs Yisrael to use perfect and just weights and measures in the conduct of their business transactions. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 15. And lastly, Moshe describes the work and the ways of Jehovah as perfect to meme. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. Therefore, there is a sense of the people of Jehovah and their offerings being free from defects, free from corruption. Blameless or to meme within the context of our reading here today has to do with the wholeness of the man. That being Noah's character, Noah's behavior, Noah's attitude, and the state of his heart. That being his will bending to the will of the eternal. Genesis chapter 6 verse 22 and Genesis chapter 7 verse 5. Noah's relationship with the Most High. And I would go so far as to suggest that even his genetic makeup, spiritual and physical, everything about the man was pure, was whole. He was faultless in comparison to the general state of the creation in his day. Genetic make in contrast, or genetic makeup in contrast to the corruption that had overtaken the whole of creation. We know the story of how the genetic line was conceivably altered by the fallen ones mating with the women of men. And the whole of creation, the genetic order of creation, becoming defiled and corrupted. We know that Genesis 6 talks about the sin of the watchers and how a breed of creatures emerged from that union of the watchers and human females. And that the creatures that emerged from that union, which are, is known widely as Nephilim, well, corrupted the natural order. And if Mashiach, Messiah, Yehoshua, the seed of the woman, was to ultimately come onto the human scene, he would have to be pure and undefiled as would be required for any Jehovah-sanctioned sacrifice. That's assuming we believe in the Nephilim story and the corruption of the genetic line in the earth. I tend to believe it. I tend to side with that story. A lot of folks don't. And that's okay. I... I it doesn't, I don't fault anybody who doesn't, but to me, the Genesis account seems to strongly suggest that this was the case. But again, take it for what it's worth. Take it in light of the whole thing that we're going to be looking at today and make your decisions based upon the leading of the Spirit and your own investigation. Timothy Haig, you've often heard me talk about him. He's a Messianic author, teacher, and commentator. Sees perfect, uh, blameless, tamim, as used here in our reading, as having more to do with the man's halakha than anything else. Noah's halakha. And given that Mr. Haig tends to lean towards the conservative Jewish mindset in much of his Torah analyses, I could see how he would arrive at such a conclusion. But I believe Abba is pointing us to a greater reality as it relates to Noah and by extension us through Yehoshua Messiah, being blameless, being perfect, being tamim. Tamim for us must transcend our keeping the elements of Torah perfectly, or perfectly, tongue-tied again. However, that is supposed to, however that's supposed to look like or manifest today in any given instance, 
It has to transcend just our keeping of Torah commandments. Our to me must incorporate on top of our keeping of Father's instructions in righteousness, which is and very, very much important, which is central to our day-to-day living. But on top of this, we must have a pure and malleable heart. Our talk should be pure and holy. Our relationship with the eternal must be founded upon spirit and truth. Our heart, our health, I should say, must be good. Yeah, our health. How do we treat our bodies? Because these are the temples of Elohim. Are we treating it properly? Our thoughts, pure and holy. What are we focusing on? What do we think about? In our day dreaming times, are we thinking about him or are we thinking about other things that may not be holy and pure? Even our faith must be unshakable must be steadfast, must be righteous. And I say all this because we have a lot of folks within and outside our faith community that do a pretty good job keeping rote Torah commandments, but man, they lack in a great many other areas in their lives. And I was there, but I've repented of that and I'm trying to make changes today. So for one to be truly to me, his or her blameless must, his or her blamelessness, let's just say, must incorporate their whole being, let's just say. His or her blamelessness must incorporate, his or her to me must incorporate their whole being. Let me ask you this. Can we truly conclude that one is Tamim? Remember, Tamim incorporates the whole, the wholeness of a person. Can we truly conclude that one is Tamim who keeps Torah perfectly, but has a terrible disposition, has no faith, has really nasty thoughts from time to time? whose heart is calloused and dark. We have a lot of us like that running around in our faith community. Just saying. As it relates to Noah walking with Elohim, we're talking more of an intimate, that is a yada level relationship with the Almighty. Both Enoch and Noah possessed or dwelt in such a relationship in contrast to the dire state of humanity in their respective day. And it seems reasonable to conclude that for either of these men, Enoch and Noah, to have such a relationship with the eternal, Abba would find favor in them. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. And we discussed in last week's Torah reading that Abba searches the hearts of men and he turns towards those who have the right heart. And thus, Yah will invite the one who possesses a circumcised heart to come in and enter into a covenant relationship with him. And thus, that one begins the journey of walking with Jehovah. There is an agreement between Jehovah and his would-be child. And we covered all this in detail in Sabbath Thoughts and Reflections 4. And I would again invite you to familiarize yourself with the concept of walking with God, walking with Elohim, with Jehovah, by either listening to or reading that discussion posting. Again, I'll put or drop the link to that posting in the shows or in this installments transcript <laughs> for your your convenience uh, again at the messianic torobserver.org. I will say that I really appreciate Mr. Haig's sentiments regarding Jehovah's desire to walk with humanity. I really enjoyed that. Haig states that it is quote the goal to which everything proceeds that is to walk with God, end quote. You see, Yah wants a substantive 
personal relationship with those who would be his. And that relationship must, however, transcend any other relationship known to humanity. Thus, the purpose of the Messianic Tour Observer, this program, is not to promote Torah living as the end all to be all to a would be not sorry or set apart one or messianic, but rather the purpose of MTMO first and foremost is to promote a faithful, obedient covenant relationship with the creator of the universe. Our master, who is the fulcrum of all creation, he came primarily to point fallen humanity to Jehovah and to reestablish that cool of the day walk in humanity that Jehovah once enjoyed with Adam. And tragically, that level relationship, that relationship opportunity is inhibited by the scourge of sin, which Jehovah sent his beloved son, Yehoshua, to deal with once and for all. And so it is because of the person and personal ministry of Yehoshua that directly dealt with the sin issue that stymies that relationship, humanity now has the opportunity to truly teshiva, repent, and to enter into that covenant relationship with Jehovah. Okay, let's move on to verse 11. Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. And Alter's translation reads, you know what? We're going to do 11, 12, and 13. I'm sorry. Let's look at verses 11, 12, and 13 of Genesis 6. And Alter reads, And the earth was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled with outrage. Verse 12. And Elohim saw the earth, and look, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted its ways on the earth. Verse 13, And Elohim said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with outrage by them. And I am now about to destroy them with the earth. The orthodox understanding of the earth, which in the Hebrew is haretz, as used here in this verse, is not talking about the whole of Jehovah's living creation. Instead, the rabbis see Heretz here as referencing specifically the earth's human inhabitants, which are described as having become grossly immoral in open defiance of Jehovah, which proved to be offensive to Jehovah. The phrase filled with outrage, as used here by Alter in his translation, most likely means that Jehovah's human creation had become iniquitous. It has become lawless. The elongated lifespan of humans during this period made for a very tenuous situation. I think we would all agree. You see, the longer an iniquitous soul lives the more refined the iniquity within and around that soul becomes. That soul's iniquity doesn't just affect that individual over the course of his or her lifetime, but that individual's lawlessness also directly affects others in his or her sphere of influence, such as the individual's spouse, his children, his relatives, his friends. So as far as iniquity is concerned, by its very nature, it spreads It proliferates. We sometimes talk about the mystery of iniquity that Shaul wrote was already spreading in the world and throughout the body of Messiah in his day. And this spreading is an intentional spreading of lawlessness in the earth by both man and the enemy. Now, the orthodox understanding of the English term violence, as used here in our reading of this passage, is that of the weak being overrun in every way by the strong in society. The weak being overrun by the strong. 
there was blatant disregard for justice and the least in society were left helpless and doomed to being destroyed by those who were stronger than they were. The state of the world, that is, humanity and the whole of Yah's natural creation in Noah's day was one of utter and complete corruption and violence, according to the text, Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. The Hebrew term for corrupt used here by Moshe is shakath, shakath, which means destroyed, ruined, decayed, marred, spoiled, rotten, perverted. Now, when we consider humanity from a state of corruptness, as described in verse 11 of the sixth chapter, especially in light of the use of the Hebrew term shakath, we're talking not only about rampant and perversive sin having taken over the whole of humanity, with the exception of Noah, we also must think about the physical state of all creation. If the extra-biblical apocryphal writings are to be even remotely believed, it is indeed conceivable that even the very genetic makeup of Jehovah's natural creation, human, animal, and plant, had been altered to some degree. Not unlike the situation we're seeing around us even today. A lot of manipulation of the genetic order and of the natural creation, the natural order is being manipulated constantly by man. And so Noah's life, his existence, his relationship with the creator of the universe was certainly the rarest exception. For Mashiach, Messiah, by absolute necessity, would biologically have to come into existence through an undefiled, uncorrupted line. Bear in mind, I'm talking only from a biological perspective. Sin is not the issue in question as it relates to Yehoshua's lineage. For every member of his line sinned, every one of them. So the concern here, at least for me, is the biological purity of Messiah's line. This question of the whole of Yah's creation being shakath, corrupted, in Noah's day, seems to me to be more than a question of the sinfulness of creation. Indeed, all of humanity had become sinful beyond any conceivable level up to that time in human history. But when we look at the wording of chapter 6, Verse 9, we find Jehovah describing Noah as being perfect in his generation, or tamim dur in the Hebrew. The Hebrew suggests a more precise meaning of Noah was complete, whole, entire sound in the days, age, time period he lived. Now, there is a movement afloat in um, certain segments of denominationalism, and even within some segments of our faith community that sees this talk of Noah being perfect in his generation, specifically meaning that he was genetically pure. He had not been defiled by the corruptness that was brought on by the, the sins of the watchers. I think it I think that's something to ponder, something to think about and something to take somewhat seriously. And I've just kind of hinted that I believe it did play a part this this defiling of the genetic order in nature and I certainly but I don't put everything in that basket. That's I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I think it it does have a lot to do with the genetic pureness, that Noah's genetic purity. But I think it also has to do with his spirituality, his relationship with the, with the Almighty, his walking with Elohim, his his righteousness. I think it's the whole thing. It's the wholeness. He was whole, especially in contrast with the corrupt nature of 
humanity in his day. So I don't like to limit my understanding of this perfect in his generations to just this whole idea that he didn't carry within him the Nephilim gene. And that gets a little beyond, I think, reason at times, but it certainly had a lot of impact. It just was not the end all and be all that a lot of people are putting all of their attention in. So that's enough of that for now. But in most English translations of this passage, the word or the world of Noah's day, the world of Noah's day is described as being violent. Chapter 6, verse 11. The Hebrew term used here for violence is kamas, kamas, which means violence, but also means wrong, cruelty, and injustice. When we consider the English term violence from our 21st century Western way of thinking, most of us would probably see Noah's world as being filled with murderers and acts that caused people physical harm. But the Hebrew expands this definition just a bit by suggesting to us that Noah's world, in addition to murders and injurious acts being inflicted against one another, humanity engaged in, as though it was part and parcel of its character, wrongdoing of every kind. We're talking cruelty to one another. We're talking injustice. It was morally, physically, and psychologically and spiritually a dangerous time and place to live. Not unlike some of the major cities of our nation today, huh? Many places in the world today. This morally bankrupt, physically and psychologically and spiritually bankrupt corruptness that has overtaken our world here in the 21st century. Contrary to conventional wisdom, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were not destroyed for the sole reason that its citizens were practicing homosexuality. That's what I used to think. I think, wow, that's the only reason they got destroyed. And father was really upset about this homosexual thing that was going on. It was prominent in that city. But the prophet Ezekiel declared the following as it relates to this issue of Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, and the English Standard Version reads, Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. He's contrasting Sodom, and he's kind of saying to, to Judah, this, you know, is your sister Sodom. It was kind of an insult, but he's saying, this is the guilt of your sister Sodom. This is what happened with Sodom. This is why I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. This is why. Pride, fullness of bread, that is abundance of food without giving thanks to the one who provided that food. And careless ease was in her and in her daughters. That is, they were careless and complacent. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, or rather, they flagrantly ignored the well-being of the forgotten in their societies. Again, this was Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49. So Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed for being morally corrupted and completely obtuse towards the provisions and ways of Jehovah. And Israel was following in that same footprint. Thus, this prophecy of Ezekiel, chapter 16, verse 49. And, and a similar environment existed in Noah's day, although the moral fabric of society in Noah's day was probably far worse, if one can imagine that. Nevertheless, Noah had overcome all these horrendously negative variables and was walking blamelessly and righteously with Jehovah. And it was Noah who Jehovah selected to carry forth the seed line that would bring about the seed that would ultimately crush the serpent's head. Let's go on over to the last two verses of our reading today that we're going to look at. Verse 
22 of chapter 6 in Genesis, and then verse 1 of chapter 7. Verse 22 reads, And this Noah did, as all that Elohim commanded him, so he did. And then lastly, verse 1 of chapter 7, And Jehovah said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, for it is you I have seen righteous before me in this generation. J.H. Hertz, in his Torah and Haftarah, provides a very interesting perspective here as it relates to Jehovah seeing Noah as righteous before him in that generation or doer, that time period or day of his. Hertz provides for us the following moral rabbinic principle. Quote, utter only a part of a man's praise in his presence, which is what we see described here in this verse on that, on the part of Jehovah towards Noah. Utter only a part of a man's praise in his presence, but thou mayest speak the whole of a man's praise in his absence. End quote. And Hertz goes on to add to this thinking a truth that it is human nature for people to talk about another's personal deficiencies in an individual's absence, but will scarcely mention any of that individual's deficiencies while in their presence. So here, what does this have to do with our the, these two verses? Verse 22 of chapter 6 and verse 1 of chapter 7. Well, if we are to use this rabbinic rubric as sort of a moral guide, or template, rather, Jehovah through Moshe extols throughout our reading Noah's many virtues, such that he was blameless, he was righteous, he walked with Jehovah. But Jehovah chooses to utter directly to Noah just a portion of those many virtues. In other words, Jehovah chose not to blow up Noah personally, to his face. Such personal overpraise, let's just say, of an individual may lead to, of course, a big head, which may lead to a great fall. This is one more testimony from Jehovah that Noah was a righteous man, chapter 6, verse 9, and that he was blameless in his day. Noah did all that Jehovah commanded him. Noah was obedient. On top of being blameless, on top of being righteous, on top of walking with Jehovah, he did what he was commanded to do. Ezekiel chapter 14 offers an interesting perspective as it relates to Noah, in particular his righteousness. The prophet reveals the mind of Jehovah by Yahs, contrasting what he will do to a people who grievously sin against him and his ways with what will happen to his righteous ones such as Noah, Daniel, and Job. Ezekiel chapter 14 verses 13 through 20 and the English Standard Version reads, Son of man, when a land sins against me by acting faithlessly, Ma'al, or trespassing to a grievous level. And I stretch out my hand against it and break its supply of bread and send famine upon it and cut off from it man and beast, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it. They would deliver by their own lives by their righteousness declares the sovereign Jehovah. Verse 16, even if these three men were in it, as I live, declares the sovereign Jehovah, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters. They alone would be delivered, but the land would be desolate. Verse 17, or if I bring a sword upon that land and say, let a sword pass through the land and I cut off from it man and beast. Verse 18, Though these three men were in it, as I live, declares the sovereign Jehovah, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they alone would be delivered. 
verse 19. Or if I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my wrath upon it with blood to cut off from it man and beast, verse 20, even if Noah, Daniel, and Job were there, as I live, declares the sovereign Jehovah, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness. The sins of a people will ultimately lead to Jehovah's judgments against those people and their sin. From both an individualistic and a nationalistic perspective. This becomes all the more evident and manifested when a people's sins reach the level of it becoming a way of life for that people. Even epidemical, even gross, even universal, heinous in its level and intensity. Because Jehovah is righteous and just. He must respond accordingly. I would recommend if you are so led to read or listen to our post entitled Let God Be True and Every Man a Liar, where we discuss Jehovah's righteous and just character that compels him to judge humanity accordingly. Jehovah's judgments may not come about when and how we, Jehovah's set apart ones, feel they should. For Yah sets the time and manner of his judgment, but judgment will inevitably come. And the judgment will be extended vigorously and openly to all who are connected and for heaven and earth to witness it accordingly. His, Yehovah, Yahweh Yahuwah's judgment will be in proportion to the extent of the people's sins. Later on, we find that despite Yehovah's wrath and judgments decimating the greater population of a sinful people, he will inevitably reserve some remnant as an attestation to his mercies that he extends to humanity, verses 22 and 23. Furthermore, we have seen where Jehovah will, in accordance with his perfect will and righteousness, spare a nation from judgment for a given amount of time for the sake of his righteous remnant. Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 11. We have even the example of Jehovah's willingness to what? To spare Sodom for the sake of ten righteous ones. That was Avraham pleading. But what if there's ten righteous? And they said, yeah, if we can find ten, we'll save the city. Genesis chapter 18, verses 27 through 33. Very amazing argument and petition from Avraham. And to hear fathers response. But as it applies to our reading here today, we see all these elements played out. Jehovah's wrath and judgment ultimately would be poured out upon the whole of the earth, but his mercies extended to humanity by his saving of righteous Noah and his immediate family. Despite all the creation having become corrupted in all its ways in Noah's day, Noah found favor in Jehovah's eyes. How did Noah find favor in Jehovah's eyes in that day? It was Noah's trusting obedient. That's trusting obedience comes from the complete Jewish Bible rendering. Stern uses this constantly to describe this covenant relationship, this trusting obedient that caught Abba's attention and which caused Abba to make provision for Noah and his family to escape the creator's wrath. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Hebrews, 11, chap, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 in the Aramaic English New Testament reads, By faith, Noah, when he was told of things not seen, feared. Remember, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But by faith, Noah, when he was told of things not seen, feared. And he made himself an ark for the life of his household, whereby he, Noah, condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Now, as it relates to one receiving the righteousness of Elohim, which is faith-based, 
I invite you to listen to or read our discussion entitled The Righteousness of God is the Place Where Obedience and Faith Intersect. This part one, what is the righteousness of God? We talk about the righteousness of God and how faith and obedience balance out. And we're going to be continuing that in part two in the coming days. But Noah provides us an example as to who will ultimately prevail in the midst of Jehovah's wrath and judgment. When the righteous live by their faith, they will be saved one way or another. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. We know that given the terrible state of humanity today, especially in light of the signs of the times we're presently living in, Yah's judgment and wrath are indeed at humanity's front door. We're starting to see evidence of this, I believe, in the form of unprecedented natural disasters around the world, diseases, financial ruin, increased natural and unnatural deaths of individuals and the like. Oh, it's global warming! <laughs> no, my friends, I don't believe it has anything to do with so-called global warming. That's why we need the Green Deal. No, it's not because you're going to pass all the green deals and you're going to do everything you can do to try to alter and put forth this agenda. And I'm speaking to Washington and the globalists. Yeah, you put all these things out there and you're going to still completely be decimated by all of these things that are coming upon humanity because of their sin. It's judgment. It's Yah's wrath ramping up. We who are Yah's set-apart remnant in the earth must learn and strive to live by faith. That faith transcends that of a simple cognitive understanding that Yehovah exists. James, the half-brother of our master Yehoshua, provided a sobering perspective on such base-level faith. James chapter 2, verse 19. Thou believest that there is one Elohim. Well, you doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Indeed, this base level faith does not lead to one being conferred right standing before a holy and righteous Elohim. It certainly cracks open the door a little to a greater faith that leads to righteousness. That level of faith that leads to the righteousness of Elohim that righteousness of God is an action-based faith. I define it as more an obedience-based faith. The obedience of faith. Romans chapter 16, verse 26. And I would invite you to listen to or read our discussion related to the topic of an obedience-based faith entitled Obedience Versus Faith, Paul in the Book of Romans series. And again, I'll put the link to the post in the show's transcript for your convenience, if you're so led. But this greater or greatest level of faith is the faith that Abel, that Enoch, that Noah, and Abraham all walked in, or Halakud end. And yes, this level of faith begins with the cognitive belief that Jehovah exists and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. But the righteousness of God-level faith that these patriarchs all walked in is a trusting faith that encompasses one walking in obedient covenant relationship with the eternal. It's comprised of a true and substantive, even intimate, yada relationship with Jehovah. It requires a circumcised heart, a will that subordinates itself to the will of Jehovah. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. And so this one readily obeys Jehovah's instructions, Jehovah's commandments, because he or she both fears and loves him. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Fear Elohim and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The one who would be righteous must also love Jehovah. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, And thou shalt love Jehovah thy Elohim with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. 
also echoed in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, and Luke chapter 10, verse 27. For if we love him, if we truly love him, we will keep his commandments, stated Yehoshua, our master. John chapter 14, verse 15, and John chapter 15, verse 10. But because Noah was faithful, because Noah was righteous, because he was blameless and he walked with Jehovah, he established a covenant with him. Genesis 9. When we walk in faithful obedience, Jehovah establishes a covenant with us. Under the renewed covenant, he comes to live within us. In so doing, he inscribes his law into our hearts and in our minds. And most importantly, he will no longer remember our sins and iniquities. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. And, and those sins and iniquities separate us from Jehovah. And they condemn us to damnation and destruction. And so it is in his not remembering our sins and iniquities, we receive his righteousness. We receive right standing before him. Now let's take a look at these passages that we've read here in our readings from the perspective of the apocryphal books of Jubilees, Jasher, and Josephus. Starting with Jubilees, the writer of Jubilees introduces Noah to the reader as a man dwelling in a world dominated by the Nephilim. The Nephilim factor big in the book of Jubilees. The Nephilim being the products of the union between the fallen ones, which also are referred to as the Watchers, and the daughters of men. And from this abrupt incursion into and disruption of Jehovah's natural creation, the writer describes the world of Noah's day as being corrupted in all its ways and with increasing lawlessness, iniquity. Lawlessness is also described in English as iniquity in the Hebrew havan, havan, which means perversity, depravity, iniquity, guilt. And this Corrupt condition apply to all flesh, according to the text. Chapter 5 of Jubilees. Alike men and cattle and beasts and birds. This is, this is taken directly out of Jubilees. Quote, alike men and cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walked on the earth, all of them corrupted their ways and their orders. And it goes on further to state that every imagination of the thoughts of all men was thus evil continually. That's an echo from the Genesis account. Now, in all fairness to the Jubilee version of the Noah story, the corruptness of humanity cannot be entirely blamed on the Watchers. Indeed, the Watchers, according to the books of Enoch and Jubilees, have tremendous culpability as it relates to the corruption of all aspects of Jehovah's creation. And so the sins of the Watchers in the eyes of Jehovah was unforgivable and required the destruction of all living things in order to correct, to some degree, their evil influences, the Nephilim's evil, or I should say not the Nephilim, but the Watcher's evil influences. But certainly the heart of humanity had strayed so far from the ways and will of Jehovah that it's, quote, every imagination of its thoughts was evil continually, end quote. This was over and above the physical corruption of Jehovah's creative order that was blamed on the sin of the fallen ones. And so we'll see just how bad the hearts of humanity had become in the ancient book of Jasher's rendition of this story. So in the book of Jasher, the, writing, the writer, I should say, states that Noah followed in the footsteps of his grandfather Methuselah, who the writer described as perfect or blameless, tamim, and upright with Jehovah. And this is in the fourth chapter of Jasher. Now, a very interesting point to be understood here is that Jasher completely ignores the whole Watcher's story as told in Genesis 6 and in the book of Jubilees. The writer of Jasher blames only humanity for creation's corruption. It reads, 
quote, and all the sons of men departed from the ways of Jehovah, which implies that humanity once followed in the ways of Jehovah. And in those days, the days of Noah, as they multiplied upon the face of the earth, the sons and daughters, and they taught one another their evil practices, and they continued sinning against Jehovah. And every man made unto himself a god. You know, this is the first time in the record of people actually worshiping other gods, engaging in paganism and worshiping idols. And he continues, and they robbed and plundered every man, his neighbor, as well as his relative, and they corrupted the earth. And the earth was filled with violence. And here's where the disparity comes into play as it relates to the meaning of Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, where Moshe writes that, quote, the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of Elohim came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men of old, men of renown. But Jasher makes clear that those sons of Elohim were, quote, Again, the focus is on humanity as opposed to any angelic being, fallen angelic being. It's focusing on humanity, fallen humanity, badly corrupted humanity. It writes, quote, and their judges and rulers went to the daughters of men and took their wives by force from their husbands according to their choice, end quote. Interestingly, Jasher accuses the son of men in that day of, quote, taking from the cattle of the earth, the beast of the field, and the fowls of the air, and taught the mixture of animals of one species with the other, such as crossbreeding, in order therewith to provoke Jehovah. Interesting, huh? So there is still that element of the corruption of the genetic order, even in the book of Jasher. Now, in connection to humanity in some way having prior to this time walked in the ways of Jehovah, the writer makes note that the corruptness of the earth came about after, quote, all men who walked in the ways of Jehovah, end quote, had died off in those days. That is, that generation or that period of time in human history. And it would thus appear that Methuselah and his grandson Noah were the last of that generation of humanity that, quote, walked in the ways of God, end quote. Now, we would be remiss in our not giving any serious attention to the Jasher notion of humanity at some point prior to and leading up to Noah's day walking in the ways of Jehovah, because we have that mysterious but powerful little statement at the second half of Genesis chapter 4, verse 26, that asserts that when Seth begat his son Enos, quote, then men began to call upon the name of Jehovah. So there's some connection there. How much of a connection it is, it's a mystery still. Furthermore, if you recall, the third chapter of Jasher re regales the life of Enoch, whereby the reader is told how some segment of humanity turned to and walked in Jehovah's ways, as a result of Enoch's righteous example, his leadership, his teachings on Yah's way. And we discuss this in some detail in our post entitled, What It Means to Walk with God, a Messianic Discussion of Parasha 4, Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 through Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. I'll put the links in the show's transcript for your convenience. Well, the Jasher account goes on to add a substantive flavor to the whole Noah story that seems to support the Apostle Kephas, the Peter's description of Noah as, quote, a preacher of righteousness, end quote. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5, who apparently during the 120 years he was building the ark, he preached repentance or teshiva to humanity.
The passage reads, Speak ye and proclaim to the sons of men, saying, Thus saith Jehovah, Return from your evil ways and forsake your works. And Jehovah will repent of the evil that he declared to do to you, so that it shall not come to pass. For thus saith Jehovah, Behold, I give you a period of 120 years. If you will turn to me and forsake your evil ways, then will I also turn away from the evil which I told you, and it shall not exist, saith Jehovah. And that was in chapter 5 of Jasher. It goes without saying, according to the Jasher account, humanity refused to hearken to Noah's call to Teshuvah, to repent. And the text emphasizes, in a sense, that Jehovah's grace prevailed for those 120 years. And the book of Jasher does agree with the book of Genesis account that Noah was a just or a righteous man who was perfect or blameless in his generation, in his time. But the writer also emphasizes that Noah was chosen of all the peoples of the earth at that time for purposes of, quote, raising up seed from his seed upon the face of the earth because Jehovah saw Noah as righteous in that generation or in that day, end quote. Now, some have attributed an eschatological meaning to the quote, Jehovah chose Noah to raise up seed for his seed upon the face of the earth. The raising up of seed from his seed, that ultimate seed being Yehoshua. And that interpretation does appear to be reasonable to me, presuming we believe the Jasher account, but the author's original intent could have just as easily been a pragmatic one that Jehovah chose righteous Noah to preserve humanity, preserve human seed from the coming wrath and judgment, and carry on the instruction of humanity to, quote, be fruitful and multiply, end quote, as Jehovah told Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1, verse 22, and chapter 1, verse 28. And lastly, let's look at Josephus's account of Noah's story and the antiquity of the Jews. And this is chapter 3. It's interesting to find Josephus's accounting of the Noah story to kind of line in some areas with both the Jubilees and Jasher account, believe it or not. Josephus asserts that the line of Seth leading up to Noah's day was righteous. For seven generations, he asserts seven generations. He then states that as time progressed, that is, coming into Noah's day, humanity became perverted, forsaking the ways of the fathers, paying no honor to Jehovah, and living iniquitous lives absent any justice. And Josephus makes mention of the fact that Jehovah loved Noah for his righteousness, which none of the other accounts even mentions Jehovah having love for Noah. Yes, it is given that Jehovah loved Noah. It's just not stated or mentioned in our Torah reading. A couple interesting perspectives are introduced in Josephus' account, which is kind of a lean account so far in Josephus, but I'll share these two little nuggets with you. One, Jehovah intended to make another race to replace that wicked one that he intended to destroy. That race would have their lives cut short by to just 120 years instead of the thousand years that the patriarchs were once living. And that race would be pure from wickedness. The other nugget is Noah's building of the ark was not a commandment, but rather a commandment from Jehovah, but rather a suggested contrivance and a way of escape for Noah and his family. It wasn't a commandment, it was a suggestion. It was an urging. <laughs> I find that interesting. So let's, now that we've kind of given this overview of our reading, let's, um, let's kind of round off this discussion and talk about practical notesari halakha, walking in what we have here before us, and the example of Noah's story. Noah pleased Jehovah, or rather Noah found favor in Jehovah's eyes in the midst, arguably, of the most wicked period of human history. 
And scripture records that Yah's wrath and judgment would ultimately destroy all life on the earth in response to the unprecedented wickedness and corruption to his natural order. And most importantly, it was that blessed favor that saved not just Noah and his immediate family from physical destruction, but also us from eternal spiritual destruction. For from Noah's line would emerge our master Yehoshua Messiah, and his personal ministry would bring to all humanity the opportunity to escape eternal damnation. Noah's story is ultimately one of grace. Grace. Yehovah's grace being shed upon his human creation, despite his human creation being convicted and found guilty in the court of heaven for its sinfulness and lawlessness. Jehovah's love overshadowed the regret and anger he had towards humanity because there was a man walking in the midst of this corrupt, wicked, and damned world who refused to take the path of least resistance. And that path of least resistance that is simply giving in to the corruptness into the wickedness of the world would have no doubt made Noah's life so much easier, at least up to the day that Yah's wrath and judgment would be unleashed upon the world. But he did not take the path of least resistance. Conventional wisdom would have us believe, however, that Noah was some kind of super, bigger than life, perfect in every way, patriarch hero of the Bible who could do no wrong. And thus it is universally reasoned that he found favor in God's sight because he was Noah. He was a paradox. He was an enigma. He was a fluke of the universe, if you will. And indeed, in a sense, he kind of was. But he wasn't all these amazing things because he was somehow made or drawn that way. He was all these amazing things because he made a decision. He made a conscious decision to not take the path of least resistance. He decided at some point in his life not to choose the world But instead, choose Yehovah, Yahweh, Yahuwah, however you declare his name. And I would submit to you that Noah's decision to choose Yehovah, to enter into a covenant relationship with him and to walk in Yah's ways was no doubt met with a great deal of opposition. Although not mentioned in our Bible, we get a sense from at least one apocryphal writing that the world vehemently opposed Noah's righteous living and his call for humanity to Teshiva to repent and escape the wrath to come. And that was in, from Josephus' account we just talked about. But the writer of the book of Hebrews highlights Noah's faith in Jehovah and his word as, quote, putting the world under condemnation, end quote while the Apostle Peter highlights Jehovah's patience, Yah's grace being extended upon humanity, quote, while the ark was a preparing, end quote. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, and 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, respectively. Now, whether or not we choose to believe Josephus' assertion or deduce from the apostolic record that Noah preached, the unpopular message of Teshiva, to the corrupt society of his day, it cannot be denied that he, Noah, ran an arduous race of faith in his day that led to him and his family being saved from the wrath that was to come. That life race that he ran, I say, provides us a critical example and, dare I say, a spiritual mandate as it relates to our being able to please Yah in such perilous times as we're living today. The days we're currently living are not 
Too unlike the days of Noah leading up to the Great Flood, we can all agree that the entire world has corrupted itself to such a point that all that remains is the coming Great Tribulation and our Master's return. Master told us that in the last days there would be deceiving spirits operating in the world. There would be wars and rumors of wars, with nations rising up against nations, that Yah's elect would face tremendous persecution and tribulation at the hands of society and even at the hands of those who would appear to be set-apart ones. It's not made its fullness yet, but we're seeing it start to ramp up in the world. Yah's people are becoming the most persecuted souls on the planet. It's all over the news. But it's not being carried by the news. <laughs> you have to kind of dig for it and find it. But it's happening more and more. For those seemingly set apart ones will set out to betray the true body of Messiah with intense hatred and resentment. Lawlessness or iniquity will abound, not just in the world, but even within the body of Messiah. And people's genuine sensitivity towards one another will fade will fade to a point where folks just no longer care about other people, no longer care about their families, no longer care about the brethren, choosing instead to care only for themselves. But even in the midst of all this chaos and turmoil, Master prophesied that the gospel of the kingdom, also known as the Besorah, it will be proclaimed in all the world as a witness unto all nations. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 14. Folks, isn't the state of our world very close to that of Noah's day? Isn't the wickedness and corruption of the world as in Noah's day folding in and around Jehovah's people? Aren't Jehovah's people having in many cases to live exclusively by their faith? The violence is so bad in virtually every area of our nation that people no longer can place their faith in law enforcement to protect them. Yah's people are having to now learn to trust Jehovah for their safety. The erosion of our civil liberties and constitutional rights that afford us the opportunity to walk in our faith, to live by our faith, to walk in covenant relationship with the Father openly and freely and joyously while they're being eroded. And, they've, and these erosions have led many of y'all's elect to be canceled in our society. Some have lost the ability to provide for themselves and their families. Many of us who belong to Jehovah each day run the risk of being physically harmed or incarcerated because we choose to walk in righteousness and not take the path of least resistance, just like Noah. Many of us are now learning to trust Jehovah exclusively for our well-being, exclusively for our income, our substance and our sustenance, our careers and so forth. We're learning how to live by our faith. As it relates to the world today, very few are interested in hearing Jehovah's word. The world is not interested in having a blessed covenant relationship with the creator of the universe, which in and of itself defies the very makeup of the human soul. The human soul was designed. It was drawn. <laughs> it was made to yearn for, to seek out, to grasp hold and enter into a relationship with their maker. But that desire, that yearning, the intent is all but dead within the average individual today, as it was in Noah's day. Instead, the overwhelming vast majority of souls on this planet simply want to live and let die. They want instead to have relationships with other gods. But those gods little g-gods are that of government, of pharmacia, of sex and perversion, of entertainment, of liberalized education, of fame and fortune, of possessions, of religion. Jehovah's righteousness and justice cannot allow humanity's corruption 
humanity's evil, humanity's wickedness and lawlessness to go unabated indefinitely. He must respond with righteous and holy judgment and put down the chaos once and for all. But for Yah's people, his elect, his set-apart ones, he has called us as was told to Habakkuk regarding the remnant Jews of his day who were living in the midst of similar corruption and having to deal with abject persecution and tribulation in the land of Judah. Those righteous ones, the remnant, if you will, were told to live by their faith, to live by faith. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Now, despite all that was going on around them, and despite the gloominess of their individual and collective situations, Jehovah directed Habakkuk to tell the remnant that Jehovah is sovereign, and he knows what he's doing. But as for them, that blessed remnant, they are to simply go on living by their faith. They are to continue to walk in covenant relationship with him, to walk exclusively in his ways, to obey him and love him and love one another. Shaul echoed this same sentiment to his messianic Roman readers in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For Shaul, it was the Besorah. the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of Jehovah that revealed unto or to the world, Jehovah's righteousness. The righteousness of Jehovah is not only about the coming kingdom of Jehovah, but it is also about Jehovah's coming righteous and just wrath and judgment to be poured out upon corrupt and wicked humanity. Just as in the days of Noah, and just as it was with Noah, we are compelled and even commanded to live by faith. For it will be our faithful living that will ultimately save us from Jehovah's wrath and judgment. And it will be our faithful living that will curry us favor with Jehovah and credit us as righteous before him. The writer of Hebrews unequivocally stated that faith is absolutely required to please Elohim. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. Faith is absolutely required for one to find favor in Jehovah's sight. Faith is absolutely required for us to escape the coming judgment and wrath of Yah. Yah takes great pleasure in the faith, the faithful walk, the faith-based covenant relationship he has with his set-apart ones. Oh, he certainly does. So much so that he rewards those whose faith leads them to diligently seek out and walk in his ways. Habakkuk, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Noah was rewarded for his faith. And it was Noah's faith that pleased Yah and caused Yah to save Noah and his immediate family. Of this very thing, the writer of the book of Hebrews penned, Chapter 10, verses 35 through 39. And the KJV reads, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye re you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Verse 38, and here's the kicker. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. My soul shall have no pleasure in the one who draws back. Verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but to them that believe to the saving of the soul. And that again was Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 through 39. Beloved, The only way to find favor in Jehovah's sight is for us to live by faith, to walk faithfully in his ways, to enter into and remain steadfastly in an obedient covenant relationship with him. In so doing, we not only please Jehovah, especially in perilous times such as these we are living, but we will ultimately be saved from the wrath and judgment to come, as was Noah and his family. But there's an additional benefit to our living in faith in these perilous times. 
we will ultimately live and reign with our beloved Master Yehoshua Messiah in the coming kingdom. Of this, Master Yehoshua stated, and this is recorded in Matthew chapter 13, verses 41 and 43. And the KJV reads, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So I say to you in closing, my dear brothers and sisters of the true faith once delivered, let us build our own arcs of safety in fear and in trembling. Obedient to Jehovah's instructions and in righteousness, with an unshakable trusting faith in him and in his words. How do we build our own arcs of safety? <laughs> Quite simply, walk in Jehovah's ways and do his will. Stop sinning and do his will. Follow his commandments. Trust him and his words. Do not take the path of least resistance by conforming to the demands and enticements of this world. Resist! Trust in Jehovah only and exclusively. Instead, let us follow the footsteps or in the footsteps an example of Yehoshua, our Messiah. Let us not be intimidated by the assertive nature of our world or the world around us. I say our world, I correct myself, of the world around us because this is not our home, my friends. We got a home not made by human hands. <laughs> But instead, trust that Abba has our backs and that he will deliver us in the end. Let us love him and love the brethren with a pure and unselfish love. And let us die to self and do the work of the gospel while it is still day. Because, frankly, the night is coming. The flood is coming. And no man will be able to work then. John chapter 9, verse 4. Until next week, Sabbath thoughts and reflections discussion. Shabbat Shalom. Shavua Tov. And may you be most blessed, fellow saints in training. Take care. <laughs>